So this lecture is going to be the MEP noise and vibration control part two. A lot of these concepts could apply to things other than just building systems, MEP, but um, the kind of the main topic of it, we're using the ASHRAE manual as the as our reading material and reference for this. So we're mostly sticking in that realm, but just remember it doesn't only apply to that. You might be designing a robot and need to bring some air in to, to cool and, or, or more that you have like a vacuum pump inside and you still need to allow air in and out, but you want to try to attenuate that noise before it gets out into the environment whether it's just for environmental noise control or maybe it's a military application and you need to um, you know, make sure that it's not audible to the enemy. Anyways, let's get into it. Actually, let's pick up where we left off. So this slide here, this HVAC noise slide. So we had just introduce the criteria. I'm, I'm moving backwards a slide. But this is the, the criteria from the ASHRAE handbook and just background noise criteria for all these different spaces. So we're saying that ideally HVAC related background noise should not exceed the values in table one. So that's the main thing. But then also, and, and some of these will sort of try to attempt, or they all try to attempt this in a way, some better than others, but it, it is something that a person needs to pay a little extra attention to. Like I said with the RC stuff, the, the neutral spectrum is the ideal, but there might be rumbly, there might be hissy, and you need to know when that's not okay, even if the, the number matches what's in the table. But So beyond matching that number in the table, we want it to have the following characteristics. So we want balanced contributions from all parts of the sound spectrum. So meaning low, medium, high frequencies and into proportions. It, you know, it's fairly similar to A weighting, just at more low frequency sound is acceptable because we're less sensitive to it. And fortunately that is the louder harder sound to deal with from MEP systems. And then as we move up to mid and high frequencies, we have re we need reduced levels. It follows that same curve. Then no predominant frequency bands of noise. So we, we don't want anything tonal. And then we, we say that again in this next one. So not only so the, the, the point of above, this one, not only just tones, but like you don't want it rumbly, right? You don't want a lot of bass. You don't want it really hissy. You don't want a lot of high end. You want something that is, when you have a, when you have broader band noise, um, and also when it's more consistent in time, we kind of touched on that a little bit with the, the VFDs, then it's a lot less offensive. Now we're getting more specifically into the tones. So this bullet point, no audible tones such as a hum or whine. If tones are particularly annoying and they can, say so you have other background noise of say it's open office space and there's kind of that hum of office activity. There's a, a tone or a whine from the HVAC system. Like we talked about that condensing unit that was just sitting right out, or actually, yeah, a, there's a number of condensing units, but sitting right outside of a window and its tone went, was the exact same frequency as the mass airspace mass of the glass. It just went right through it. That was an open office setting and it was, that tone was incredibly annoying to the people. And then no fluctuations in level such as throbbing or pulsing. So that's more about that time aspect of it. We, we, so both in frequency and time, in both of those domains, we want it to be, so we want broadband following age, shape, 
or A weighting in frequency and in time, we just want steady. Just even coverage of the frequency band, even over time. This, so it, we, we talked about how we want to get noise data that was from the laboratory test. And if it's a laboratory test, or even if it's a, you know, sometimes field tests are done too, you want to follow the industry standards. There are lots of different standards. The American Heating and Refrigeration Institute, they publish a lot of different standards. I think most of their standards are free. Um, sound power levels is, is what you'd want. Sometimes you get sound pressure levels at a specified distance. These, I think you usually have to, I would prefer sound power levels. If you have this, then you can just insert it into your model for whatever the environment is. You, um, if you have sound pressure levels, you usually have to calculate backwards from, say, like a hemispherical free field to get the sound power, and then you move forward from the sound power level to the sound pressure level at the receiver in the environment that you're interested in. It's not very often that this saves you much time. There are some cases. So say sometimes you'll get sound pressure levels at 30 feet. And say that the property line is at 60 feet. Then you could... So minus six decibels because you're doubling the distance away. And then say it's like right up against the backside of a building. You'd have plus three for the, the reflection off that building. So you'd, you'd end up just subtracting three from that sound pressure levels. But usually things don't work out that easily. Usually they'll give you sound pressure levels at 30 feet for some rooftop unit, but it's like you need to find for four feet away because it's going down to the roof of a building. You'll, you'll have to calculate back to get that. You should know how to do that at this point. One other thing I'll say is manufacturers can really make their data confusing. And I think a lot of times is they have somebody that's doing it that is maybe knows enough to be dangerous, but <laughs> that's that's about it. You'll you'll get a lot of time, a lot of data where just the way that they label it, you, you don't know if they even know the difference between sound power levels and sound pressure levels and A-weighted and non-A-weighted. So it, it can be quite confusing and you really have to, like I said, it might be a thousand person company. You might need to call in and get a hold of that one person there that actually knows. They might not have one person that knows. <laughs> But um, moving on to the next point. So it says, not every product under every condition can be tested. Touched on this too. So some prediction is required. That's called band plus algorithm. So they measure it at a few operating conditions, and then they interpolate and extrapolate to get other conditions. So, you know, different pressure drops, different capacity of the air that's being delivered, stuff like that. And then there there are other things that could be added too, like they might have a lined plenum. They might have an insulated metal casing. Those things might attenuate the noise. They Some incorporate sil silencers into them. Um, maybe adding in the, the heat exchange coil might make a difference too. So you need to make adjustments to those few operating conditions that were measured to account for all of the other stuff in these two bullet points. So then if good data does not exist, try to use other equipment. And finally, if it's not an option, then use some predictive thing like ASHRAE 87. I also have Hoover and Keith here. That That's a good reference. Um, this ASHRAE 87 one was just for fans. But Hoover and Keith, they publish a lot of things for chillers, package rooftop units, pumps, all, all the equipment that a mechanical engineer might be specifying. They'll they at least give um, some method of getting in the ballpark. 
think up here when I was talking about this, I wanted to say that I sort of said this, but I wanted to expand on it a little bit more. Most modeling is set up to begin with sound power levels. And definitely all of the 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 major like commercially available noise prediction software is going to want you to put in sound power levels. And I don't know if it's just because that's the way people think, but the, most of the the little ones that I've made myself, maybe I shouldn't call them little because some of them are pretty elaborate, but those ones also basically starts with sound pressure levels. It, it's always a second step to try. Sorry, did I say sound pressure? I meant sound power levels. It's always a second step to go from sound pressure levels back to sound power and then move forward with your model. It's almost always the case. But let's move on to the next slide. Well, I'm going to, this Hoover and Keith, I'm going to give you an, at least one example of that, and I'll, I'll try to give you some more equations that they give for predicting the noise produced by various equipment. Now, one of the most common pieces of equipment is just an air handling unit. Essentially, it's a fan or a number of fans. It, it sort of have a supply and a return, and it might be, sometimes it's just that. You're bringing air out of the building, and then you're sending it through the coils to heat it or cool it. There, there's like two pipe systems. There's four pipe systems. It just talks about how easy it is for them to switch back and forth between providing hot and cold. But it, they'll send that air through the coils, and they'll send it back into the room. Sometimes they bring in outside air, to, so you're mixing in a certain amount of fresh air, and when it does that, you're exhausting part of it as well. Uh, so so that, that's a really basic unit. There are variants of this, like a dedicated outdoor air system or like a makeup air unit. Um, but just this casing with fans in it and then air coming in and out in various configurations. The, the fans are the primary noise source. There aren't condensing units in it. So you have a remote boiler or remote chillers. They provide, so heat, uh, the, the refrigerant, for example, is piped to the unit and goes through the coil, and then the fan just pushes the air through that. And it says here this is typically good acoustically because air handling units are a lot quieter than the packaged units. Packaged units are, say, when you include those condensing units. The... It, a, a lot of projects want to go with the, the packaged rooftop units. It's a pretty popular design, and it, it has its advantages, but that's not very good acoustically. Those condensing units add a lot more noise. If you have a pretty critical application, then you, just, you want to have your air handling units, and then you want to remote the chillers and the boilers and all, all that. It, it it's it's more expensive to remote the chiller, but something that often is not considered in the less expensive or what appears to be less expensive option of remote or, or just having a packaged unit is once you have a packaged unit, then say you you need to put like a concrete pad or you know you need there's a lot of more money in noise mitigation. And if that was factored into it, then the, the remote chiller option would not look nearly as, as better. So this is what manufacturer provided data usually looks like. You have radiated. So this is just the fan noise that comes out through the casing of the unit. Unit discharge, that would be also known as supply. Unit return, also known as inlet. It is not always the case, but it 
it is pretty often that the return is going to be quieter than the supply. And this is likely something like part of the design. Um, maybe it's just a fortuitous um, coincidence, but the I, I showed you that slide early on in the last lecture where it showed the supply, where the supply comes in and you have these long ducts that go through the building and spread out the sound everywhere. But the return just comes in and often it, it, it's just a, a grill in the wall. Like it might come out of the unit, it might do a 90 degree elbow, and then you have it opening to the room. Or, yeah, and, and that's something that people will try to do in an auditorium. As mechanical engineers don't know any better, we'll try to do in an auditorium. Or if it's a more of an office setting, they'll just punch down through the roof and then they'll they'll just in that duct right up above um, an acoustical ceiling tile ceiling that provides very little sound isolation. So the the having the return quieter since you have this much shorter, much less noise attenuating path, this is pretty beneficial. You know, they, they might have the supply. So, so usually you have these fans and that, that ASHRAE calculation I talk about for the fans, that's for a bare fan sound power level. And sometimes some of the better manufacturers, they'll give you sound power. They'll, you'll get this big document of all the specifications for a particular air handling unit. And it's not just meant for the acoustical engineer, but it, it's a critical piece of information for the acoustical engineer. And they'll have, sometimes they'll have the bare fan sound power level. And if, it, this might be something that you might need to do in one of your predictions. If you're just taking the ASHRAE calculations, and I should say too, I, I don't have the ASHRAE 87 document with me. I'm gonna show you the calculations, the, the calculator I created from it many years ago. I'm not way back in 87, I'm not that old, but um, it was that at some point I made the calculations. I, I, I was looking for the 87 so I could provide it to you for reference, but I, I don't have that right now. Um, and if you went and looked at a library, you could went and looked at the MSU library, you'd probably be able to find it there. It's probably there in hard copy somewhere if you really want that. But um, I maybe lost my train of thought there for a moment. Oh, so you get that bare fan sound power level. And if you don't know any better, then you need to assume half of that goes to the supply and half of that goes to the return. So at this point, if we were in class, I would ask you, how do you account for that? Maybe you want to pause this and think about that for a minute. So you're back. We have bare fan sound power level. Half of it's going one direction, half of it's going the other direction. So we would just take that bare fan sound power level and subtract three from all the octave bands, right? So it happens when we have a source. But so so that is that that should maybe be the difference between supply and return. There shouldn't really be much of a difference. The the direction that the air is traveling doesn't matter because the speed of sound is so much greater. But that you know, the fan might be offset to one end of the equipment and then on the other, so as it goes through the unit, you, you have all the coils and stuff there. And then, so there's gonna be attenuation associated with that. And then you might have a, an elbow on the other end that, that's further away and bigger. And that might all be the return. So there, there's gonna be plenum silencers, elbows, whatever, some kind of lining inside the unit that's going to attenuate the return side more than the supply side before it comes out. That's why it's lower and it, it, it helps a lot in making it work with what a common HVAC design is. Now let's say a little bit about the radiated. You can note here at the lower frequencies, the radiated is not a whole lot different than the return. There's, close to 10 decibels there of a difference between the supply and the radiated. The, the radiated, 
So that's just going to be that. It's going to be that bare fan sound power level, and then there's going to be some kind of uh, insertion loss for the casing. And at low frequencies, th this is a conceptual thing we've mentioned quite a few times. Hopefully, this already popped in your head, but remember, it's hard to attenuate lower frequencies. The, the transmission losses of all those assemblies that we looked at are much lower at lower frequencies. So we don't see as much of a difference here. But if you come out here, like look at 4,000 hertz. Like here, the casing is really effective. So we're going, we have almost a 40 decibel difference, where up here it's 10 or less, or 11 or less. 11 and 2. But out here, almost 40. So this is pretty common. If it was a packaged rooftop unit, all of this stuff would probably be a little bit higher because those condensing units are, will, that noise will get into the supply and the return, but it'll be particularly louder on the radiated because those condensing units, they have exhaust fans that they just, for the most, for the most part on a basic unit are exposed to the environment. There's some where you can get baffles and stuff like that on, but they're, they're pretty much just out there in the open. Sometimes there's not even a casing. Sometimes you can, they're just sticking there in a frame and completely exposed to the world. So this stuff out here is going to be a lot higher for a packaged unit, and everything is going to be higher for a packaged unit. Like I said, sometimes outside air and exhaust are provided. I, I was talking about how those manu manufacturers' data sheets, they'll, sometimes they'll have the bare fan sound power level, and then they'll have ideally and what is more important is that they have the supply and the return and then they have outside air and exhaust if if needed or if applicable is better their way of saying that and say you had all this data and then you also had outside air and exhaust here if you were doing an environmental thing you would, it might depend on how it's oriented, like if something is really exposed to the outside air or just the exhaust, but every, it's not just going to be the radiated that radiates out from it. In that case, unless there's some ductwork on it and silencers and stuff like that, then you're just going to want to use the outside air and the exhaust and the radiated. That, that would be the most conservative thing is sum those three up and then calculate what the sound pressure level will be at a distance from that unit. A lot of times these are sitting outside, so the outside air and the exhaust are just going to be openings inside of the unit. There, there's like a louver there, a grill, but it's for the most part open. Sometimes they'll put these in attic spaces and then they need to duct over the, the outside air and the exhaust. They need to duct that over to a louver in the building. So in, in that case, you'd want to go with the sound power level for the outside air and the exhaust take out whatever attenuation you would get from the duct work. And then there's other stuff too. We don't know all this yet. We'll, we'll cover this later, but just account for all that attenuation and then calculate the sound pressure level at a distance. Um, so the, the prediction talked about that, like you get the bare fan from the Astro 87. And if it's just, if you don't know, then you send half of it toward the supply and half of it towards the return. If you do know that there's an elbow in there, you can use some of the stuff we're going to learn soon to account for that. Um, but let me show you this ASHRAE 87 calculation and some of this stuff, how that plays into it. So this is a worksheet I've put together started it many years ago, but this is just for sources and finding what the sound pressure level is at a distance from a source of a given sound power level. So I can put in five sources here. I usually put in, so, so whatever one is the going to be the worst case. I put that in here. I put the distance to the receiver. And if there are other ones that are significant, I can put them in here and then their distance to that same receiver. And this is their the Q. So this just calculates by Pythagorean you know, what 
what the overall distance is. You can have X, Y, Z coordinates. Um, put in the directivity. If it's hemispherical, you'd put a two in. So over here, I have the room constant. In this particular case, it's say a makeup air unit over. So makeup air units are, say you have a project where none of the air can be reused. Like in a kitchen, you, maybe I shouldn't say that none of the air can be used, but in a kitchen, you have these exhaust fans and they're separate from the system. You have all the, the hoods over all the, the, the stoves and all that stuff. If you, like all that air just needs to be exhausted out and not brought back into the building. So you need to have a unit just just brings in makeup air, just supply air. So that's what this is. So it's sitting on a roof. So you have uh, basically infinity. Or we we're saying room constant of a million. Um, so, so this ends up giving the sound pressure level at a receiver for the sound power levels that we enter at the distance and the directivity and the room constant. If we, so there's 76, let's change this to 10. I hope that will be 70. Yeah, close to 70. And then it sums up all these sources here. And then, so down here, I, I have collected different RC data. Like in this case, it's the outdoors, but say you had a 40 foot by 40 foot by eight foot mechanical room, concrete walls, four inch face, bat ceiling. This would be, I, I, calculated what that would be and so you you know this is a pretty common thing i would just copy and paste this into here and then so, so that increased the sound pressure level by five decibels at 10 feet away so all that diffuse field room effect stuff so a fair number or i guess not a lot i have a, a couple um room constants there you, usually I've incorporated this page into all these other templates that I have that, and I, I use, so I have a sources and then I have like a room. I, I think I showed you my calculator for determining the reverberation time of a space and you can get the room constant from, in that. So this gets populated with that spreadsheet. And then I have a spreadsheet where I have all kinds of like wall, door, window, roof, like all those different materials. And I can put together with, with their transmission loss data. So I can create a, a composite transmission loss. So I have one page for that. And then I have another page that does, so it actually, it, it draws in all that stuff to do the calculation from the source room to the receiver room. And then maybe once we get all the pieces, I'll walk you through that page, but, um, here I have a list of some kind of generic equipment that might get used from time to time. The point of me telling all that was that I, I usually, I don't use this sources only one by itself anymore. I've incorporated improved versions into these templates that I use. But he, here's the ASHRAE 87 calculation. So all the variables you need to put in. So Q in this case, this is just going to be the, the air capacity, the, the volume of air that's being supplied so 5,000 cubic feet per minute volumetric airflow is what this is and then the total pressure in inches of water so one inch so that's basically the pressure that the fans seeing through the the system of ductwork when the pressure drop is pushing against and then we have the type of fan there's a bunch of different and here, this centrifugal forward curve is a pretty common one. Then number of blades, there's a, a Sirocco fan is a pretty common one. It, it, it's, it can be fairly hard to find the exact number of blades, but the Sirocco one is fairly common. I, I use that a lot of the time if I can't find um, better data. Then RPMs, a lot of the time, 1600 RPM, but um, I, that might change. Horsepower of the motor. This is a, a critical one. These two are going to combine to give us the band pass frequency. And I'll explain that in the slide coming up. The horsepower is just nominal horsepower of the motor. That, that's a big component in it. All of that, 
that's how you calculate the bare fan sound power level. And then this one here, come, or that is only used for the radiated. If you have that bare fan and then you wanted to make a prediction of the, the radiated noise, then you want to subtract the casing from the from that sound power level, bare fan sound power level. Now I do have quite a diff few different estimates. I have a light, a, he a medium, a heavy, I have an average of data from just different calculations, but all those can get selected with a drop down menu there. So the blade passing frequency that shows up here, this ends up being, it ends up adding a couple decibels in an octave in one octave band here. Uh, all, it's just a function of how many blades and how fast it's spinning. But it adds this tonal component that can be pretty annoying. So sometimes it's barely noticeable, but sometimes it can produce a really annoying tone. And then the hydraulic efficiency of the fan. These, you don't need to see these for the, the calculator to work, but I just put them there as they, they might be interesting things to look at. Noise is, when a fan is working more efficiently, then the noise is lower. So here are all the calculations to get to the bare fan sound power level. And like I said, I, I don't, just right now, I don't have this publication to give to you, but um, if somebody really wants, I can maybe help you find it. Or if you just go to the library, you can probably find it there. Um, maybe a good search online, but it is an older publication. But it, it's, like I mentioned in other ones, lots of people still use it, so it's, it's probably still something you could find pretty easily. Then, so that's the bare fan sound power level, and then here's the casing correction to get you the radiated sound power level. Then... So that one's from ASHRAE, then the rest of these, I think most of these are from Hoover and Keith. So we have a packaged RTU calculation, condensing unit calculation, pump calculation, um, electric motor calculation, transformer calculation, boiler, generator, and then there's just some data here for, um, so a lot of this stuff is, is the data that makes those calculations work. I wanted to mention this project. This was a project I worked on, I don't even remember, it's been quite a while now more, I'd say probably 10 years or more since it was completed. But this is the Fox Theater in Riverside. There, there were a number of these Fox Theaters that were built a long time ago, like early 1900s, kind of dawn of the movie, you know, the like golden age of Hollywood type of stuff. And um, there's some pretty grand theaters. And... This this one was one of them. Gone with the Wind premiered here, for example. But um, they so this it had a long history of being used as, as a movie theater originally, and I, I don't remember all the different things. But it's kind of like the Spanish style. I, I know the Spanish revivals. So I don't know what, but um, anyways, it's, it's that style. And then eventually they they ended up doing a big renovation of it, something maybe like 10 years ago. And I was the acoustical consultant for this project. And this was one where, you know, they had all these old architectural details, historical details that couldn't really do anything with. Like, like it, it was hard to do anything to the room acoustically. But fortunately, th there were some things that we could do and it, it wasn't it really it wasn't even that bad so so like the seats had upholstery 
there were these openings and so we could get sound absorption up above so some we got some sound absorption in there the, the main thing these things up here in the corner were acoustically transparent maybe not completely but quite a bit so we were able to fit some sound absorption behind there and being these were in the corner they they were really broadband absorbers because it's a, a big distance between the absorbed material and the the solid backing behind but i, the, I didn't want to talk about this because of the room acoustics i wanted to talk about it because of the hvac noise and vibration control so all the air for this was supplied through many of these seats maybe like every third seat had a little diffuser in the floor underneath it so this project didn't really have duct work it just had these tunnels underneath so it had this big fan underground and it fed air into these tunnels and these tunnels distributed air out underneath all of these seats and I, I'm not exactly sure why they decided to do this I don't know if it's just because it was a historical building and they wanted to keep it as accurate historically as possible or if there, there was or if it was just irreplaceable and it would have required them to basically redo that whole underground tunneling system if they didn't but they they actually reused the fan that was from like 1920. It was, it was like getting close to be a hundred year old fan. And of course there was no sound power data published for that. So I use, this is a case where those ASHRAE 87 calculations came in really handy. There, there's just nothing else that could you know, be reasonably considered similar and, and use the data for that. So I, I used the ASHRAE calculations and I put a pretty big safety factor on it because I, I did, I mean, this was, you know, it, it started out as a movie theater, but music performance is its main purpose now. And I wanted to make sure that I, I didn't screw it up. So I pretty, put a pretty big safety factor on it. But it, it turned out good. It was a great project in the end. So this slide shows the, so this curve here is the noise, the sound power A weighted for the fan inlet. And this region here is the maximum efficiency. So the main point is that when it's operating at its maximum efficiency, the noise is going to be at a minimum. So if, if at all possible, you want to do that. There's, so, so one of the things about noise vibration control, there's lots of ways to attenuate the noise, but sometimes you don't have a lot of space. And fitting in a silencer might be about your only option. And you might need to get a lot of attenuation out of that silencer in a short distance. And when you do that, it adds a lot of pressure drop. Like, you know, some of these systems, it might only have an inch and a half of pressure drop. But you want to come in and add a silencer in there that's like a quarter of an inch or more. So you, there you're adding, what, one, one sixth of the, the pressure drop you want to add to it. And maybe the fan at that point was, was um, pretty close to operating in its efficient region. But if you come in and add that that pressure drop to it from your silencer, you can shift it out of there and you can make the fan produce more noise. So I'm not saying like don't use silencers because you need to use them all the time. I, I'm more just saying be aware of that and uh, hopefully you don't get yourself into a situation where you're chasing your tail, right? You put in a silencer to reduce the noise, but you move the fan out of its efficiency zone so it becomes louder so you need a bigger silencer and you, you get the, the picture so um usually when you're if you're selecting a silencer a lot of times you can find something that adds a pretty low pressure drop say like 0 0.05 inches you know so it, it, that, that would be low but um definitely far less than a quarter inch You know, and it's good for energy efficiency too to 
of the fan operate efficiently. So you don't want to cause it to be inefficient if at all possible. So here's that bait blade pass frequency equation. So the, the blade pass frequency is just the RPM. So you have revolutions per minute times the number of impeller blades. And then you divide by 60, so you end up getting it in you know, per second. If we're doing revolutions per minute times the number of blades divided by 60, then every time that blade passes by, then it's uh, um, however many times it does that within a second, that's the frequency that that blade blade pass frequency is going to be at. And like I said before, this tone can be really objectionable or barely noticeable. Now, chillers, condensers, and cooling towers, we talked about if you have the air handling unit and then you have the, the cooling, what, you know, what creates the, or what cools the refrigerant down, that would be remote. These would be options that could be used for that. So in this case, the compressors and the exhaust fans are the primary noise sources. They only provide the cooling for the coils of the air handling units. Or like condensers might be incorporated into the packaged unit. So um, I guess that, that's basically the same thing, but it's incorporated into one unit. So these don't, so the, the exhaust fans, they just cool the compressor. They, they don't, th those fans aren't pushing air into the building or drawing it back out again. So the radiated noise is all that you're really interested in here. You're just interested in how much noise is going to radiate out and then go maybe back into the building through the roof or through some window or some other opening. But, you, um, or I shouldn't say but, I should say, and also the noise propagated to the property line. You know, there's almost every jurisdiction has a limit as to what noise can be produced at the property line. And th this is something that a mechanical engineer or an acoustical engineer do not want to neglect. So it depends on the tonnage, like how many tons of cooling does it provide, the compressor and fan types, the casing, louvers, and silencers. A lot of them it just, um, aren't, aren't going to have like the, the louvers and the silencers on them. That, that's, those are kind of more specialty. Uh, let, let me just show you that. So here's an example. Just a chiller comparison. Here's the kind where you basically just have the frame. And I said a lot of times like some of that stuff is just completely visible. You have your exhaust fans on the top. It's, it's not enclosed in any kind of significant casing. It's completely open to the environment. So th this would be, you know, an environment where you, there are no neighbors that you're concerned with. It's a very industrial setting. You don't care about the noise. And then the, on the other end, where you have a really critical environment, so, so here we, we have all this at the heart of this, like, you know, what's in here is this, but here we have these um, kind of like silencers, essentially, they're, they're these baffles up on the top to attenuate the exhaust fan noise. We have acoustical louvers, so the air comes in, this is perforated metal, so it, it comes in, it has to go up, and so it sees absorption here, it sees absorption there, and then it goes into the unit. That would be like the intake air. The noise, obviously, is going the other direction. I don't know if I've ever mentioned this to you, but this, actually, I, th I think I did mention this. But this is from Multistack. They do a lot of custom equipment. They're in, I think, Sparta, Wisconsin. They're pretty close to train. I don't know why there's such an HVAC mecca there, but there is. So, um, so, so th this is like an ultra quiet chiller, and I had a project in Honolulu, Hawaii, where they had a TV station had a couple of these on the ground outside their building, and there's a residential tower right above them. They're they're the lower floors, and then the residential tower is the upper floors, 
and the noise coming out of this into those units was violating the noise ordinance. So worked with multi-stack to come up with this so that the noise ordinance would be met. Here we have a chiller comparison. So centrifugal chillers and screw chillers. I think the, so one thing to show on here would just be the difference between the centrifugal and the screw chillers. So you can see, I, I tried to scale these so they're fairly close to the line it's lining up, but you, you can see the centrifugal chillers produce quite a bit more noise. Like they have a max here at a thousand of ninety four, where this one is. This one has a max down here. It's only, that's only a couple decibels less, but we're a lot more sensitive to out here than we are here. And then this lower frequency stuff here is quite a bit louder. And here we have seven decibels louder, and here we have again seven decibels. That, that low frequency stuff, even, you know, like we said, we're, we're more sensitive out here, but usually it's pretty easy to attenuate this stuff if you get some space between you and it. But this is the stuff that's harder to, to deal with. It's, you know, say you put up a wall, it, it's going to diffract over the wall. If you, if it's in another room, it goes through the, trans, the, the, the wall, the transmission loss is not very good at low frequency, so it just goes through. Um, so centrifugal chillers can be pretty troublesome. And this wine here, this is really tonal, right? It's sticking up a lot compared to the octave bands on each side. So a lot of, a lot of trouble there. The maximum and the minimum. So I, I think this is primarily based on the, the tonnage of cooling. Here we're seeing it in kilowatts, uh, so we're in the metric system. I'm going to show you yeah, the in tons here in a minute, but um, so primarily I think the minimum is more this 450, and the maximum is the 4500 kilowatts. The and I'm going to prove that to you in a minute here, but I, I I don't think this is so much like the difference between these two, for example. But let's. Here we'll look at an example. I'll bring in a lot of what I've been talking about. So uh, an equation that can be used to predict the sound power level of outdoor chillers and condensing units is this equation right here. So this, the, I mentioned that Hoover and Keith, this is the equation that they give. It's um, 86 plus 12 log, the, the cooling capacity in tons. Not, not a very complicated equation. This something probably put a red box around that. That's a, be a, a useful one for you. Um, so to get octave bands and A weighted sound power level, you need to subtract these values. So here, this overall, you, basically you just put in the cooling capacity in tons. So say it's a, a 10 ton unit. You put 10 in here, you get your overall sound power level and then you would subtract five from that to get the 63 hertz octave band you subtract five to get the 125 hertz octave band you subtract eight to get the 250 and so on and for the dba you would subtract nine from whatever you get here so, so like i said this is from the hoover and keith so it's a handbook for a course that they taught they i know i until at least a couple of years ago, they were still teaching this course. This has been something that, so a lot of people that get into acoustics or people that are designing mechanical systems and they, you know, they, they're going to be somebody that is knowledgeable within the company that reduces noise from the mechanical systems. Actually, I haven't come across too many people that, too many just plain mechanical engineers do that do that. Usually it's an acoustical engineer. But often when somebody finishes school, this course would be what they would get sent to. It was something like $5,000 for a week or two or something like that. I can't even, maybe it's less than that. 
But um, anyways, you'd go there, you'd take this course from them, you'd get the handbook. You, it's a pretty intensive course with a lot of practical information. I never took that because I knew it all. But I'm, I'm just kidding. I didn't take it, but I didn't know it all. I did have, the, I did have my boss give me the handbook and say, learn this. Um, so we're going to use that equation to see if, how, how that equation compares to this data. So this is another, something published from ASHRAE. So here we have chillers. So here in the U.S., you're, I, I don't know that I've ever seen it in kilowatts. Um, it's, al it's always in tons. It's always going to be using our inch-pound system. I've, I've, you know, worked on a number of international projects and stuff like that, and you'll see it there, obviously. But in the U.S., it's always tonnage. I'm going to give you the conversion for that. But we have here the minimum or the sound power levels that are minimum for an outdoor chiller and the maximum for an outdoor chiller for this range. So we're going to calculate using that equation for 70 and for 1300 kilowatts and see how it matches this data. So first we need, so, so this just tells us our range. So we're writing our minimum is 70 kilowatts or max is 30, 1300 kilowatts. And here's the conversion. So one kilowatt equals 0.284 tons and um, 3.5 kilowatts equals one ton. The, so, something that you will see, so the, the tons is a really common one. And then also seeing it in BTUs, that, that's a really common one in the US. And the conversion factor for that is, is like, tw I think 12 MBTUs equals one ton of cooling. So like 60,000 BTUs would be a five ton unit. And a lot of times you'll see that, like you'll, you'll know it's a five ton unit, but the model number will have a 60 in it. So, so that's another conversion you should be aware of. But um, the sound, so, so we, we convert these using this conversion factor, the 70 becomes 20 tons, the 1300 becomes 370 tons. So th this is a pretty big unit. You know, like that, a lot of the units, well, no, it's, it's just, this is fairly small. This is, this is a pretty big unit. They're covering a pretty wide range. But we plug those in. The minimum overall is 102. The maximum overall is 117. So if we apply those corrections to these, we get these values, right? We're just, for each one of these, we're subtracting this from this and this, and we get this. Now we have this table here that's essentially our solution. Let's compare. So on the minimum, we have 97, 97, 94. So it would be like 97, 97, 94, then 91, and then 87. So at this point, we were a little bit high on the low end. And one thing, of, so like this method is from Hoover and Keith, and I, I will say I've noticed Hoover and Keith is conservative. So, you know, I think they probably do that as like a liability thing for themselves and, you know, for you too, but just to, to make sure you don't underestimate how noisy something's going to be. But they're a little over, I mean, only like four decibels, four decibels here, maybe five or six here, here they're um, maybe like three decibels. At this point, they're basically becoming like two decibels. Here they're right on. Here they're right on. Here it's a little bit above again. And then 8,000 hertz. Sometimes that gets published, but usually you don't have to worry about eight kilohertz. Um, 
But let's look at the max. So the max 112, that's about right on. This, they're a little bit above. 109, they're um, pretty close. They're one decibel off. Here, 106, they're about one decibel off. 102, this is actually quite a bit louder there. Um, so, is that about five or six decibels? Nah, here, 99. Wait, no, I'm getting off. No, that, that is right. So, 99, I guess here is maybe like three decibels off. So, pretty good. Pretty good. That's it for this lecture. See you soon.